So I was running down here at Denny's Point the other day, came right past this building, and I ducked into the woods. And I immediately tripped over a brick. And as I was picking myself off, off, off the ground, I started thinking about the brick workers and factory workers that worked out here with long shifts. And wonder if they ever thought that this building, in this land, would one day become a state park in the Center for Environmental Innovation and Education. <coughs> So when was the last time you looked at something and thought about what else could it be? Who was the first person to look at a piece of paper and think it could be a paper airplane? What about this summer-loving genius that looked at a pile of rope and an old tire and thought it could be a tire swing? Or what about every parent's favorite scenario, the child playing in the box while the toy sits off in the background? <laughs> For my six-year-old son, the world is still undefined. When he sees something new, it has unlimited possibilities. Why can't these pieces of plumbing pipe be a Native American staff and a prop for a performance art piece? I'm profoundly inspired by this idea of looking at something and wondering what else could it be. I grew up right here in the Hudson Valley. My mom was a seamstress, my dad was an engineer. And I still remember my dad sitting at the dining room table before dinner and sketching little ideas in his, in his notebook. A wine, glass, a wine bottle as a candle holder, a pile of sticks from his job as a, as a birdhouse. And my mom would always sit in her sewing room and try and figure out what to do with the scraps left over from the curtains and cushions she made for her customers. As I grew up, I made art in one form or another. But when I was about 13, I fell in love with skateboarding. The thing I loved about skateboarding was you could take your board anywhere and have fun. A curb wasn't just a curb, it was a place to skate. A bench wasn't a place to sit, it was a place for nose grinds and board slides. And when I was a skateboarder, you don't just walk downstairs, you figure out how to jump down them. So needless to say, so needless to say, Skateboarding really changed, changed my perspective and made me look at things and wonder what else they could be. As I got older, I moved around and lived in various places around the country. I found myself making friends with people who looked at the world in the same curious way. Artists and musicians, thinkers and doers. These people became my life and the community we created became my world that continues to inspire me each and every day. I met my wife Kayleen in college and she had the same spirit of curiosity and inventiveness. When she lived in New York City, she saw this and thought it should look like this. And that's her right there. <laughs> Over the years, we've worked on many creative projects together and have become friends with many amazing people along the way. And together, we have always looked at our surroundings and thought about what else could be there. In May of 2007, we moved from Brooklyn back to the Hudson Valley. I commuted to a job in New York City for a few months, but quickly realized that life was not for me. Taking a chance, we decided to start our own graphic design studio, an art gallery. We checked out Beacon and fell in love with the storefront on the east end of Main Street. At the time, the east end was a quieter, grittier part of town, but we really liked the space, and the abandoned buildings that were scattered about the area reminded us a little bit of Brooklyn, except there was a waterfall, a creek, and a mountain behind them all. So in September of 2007, we signed our lease and started Open Space. A design studio, workshop, art gallery, and we hope it will become a community event space. This building was directly across the street from our space. It dominated the block. We thought that grid of broken out windows were beautiful, but we had an idea of what else the building could be. Although renovating the building into lofts or art studios would have been amazing, that was not our plan. We didn't have the financial resources or experience to make something like that happen. What we wanted to do was fill every window with art. The idea made sense to us, and it seemed totally feasible. When we lived in Brooklyn, we spent a lot of our free time, spent a lot of our free time exploring the city, putting art out on the street. A lot of our friends did the same thing. We would always get excited when we would see one of their pieces show up on a wall somewhere. So when we looked at those massive boarded up windows, we could see the possibilities. 
But instead of anonymous overnight installations, we pictured a block party with music, food, and people painting art in the streets. We called it electric windows. But first, we needed 24 artists that were willing to paint eight foot by 12 foot canvases in front of a crowd and have it finished in the course of a day. <laughs> As you can imagine, that severely limited the pool of artists that we could work with, so we asked our street art friends first, and then artists that we admired, that they would come to a small town, the small town of Beacon, New York, and paint an abandoned building for the weekend. Every artist we spoke to that was available said yes. To be honest, we were a little surprised at the enthusiastic response. It was such an honor that these people could be so generous with their time and talent. Not a single artist asked what they were getting paid, what they would eat, or where they would stay. They all loved painting outside, and the opportunity to be part of the project was enough. The only question they asked, where's Beacon? <laughs> As we began to tell the community of Beacon about the project, they immediately wanted to be involved. The support was infectious, and we quickly discovered the power of the community we were becoming a part of. The people who owned the store next to us became our partners in organizing the event. Others agreed to open their homes to the visiting artists, restaurants committed to feed them, others volunteered their time and resources to make sure the project happened. On May 17th, we closed off the street and set up the painting frames. And people started showing up. The artists painted and the musicians played. Hundreds of people came out that day to hang out, watch the artists paint, listen to music, dance, and enjoy the party. As the day went on, the pieces that were finished were installed one by one. The building began to take, transform into the outdoor gallery we had imagined. During the event, a woman came up to me and said she had come down from the east end of Main Street, or from East Main Street. She lived up there, and she didn't know what was going on. She had heard the music and wanted to see where it was coming from. So when I started to tell her about what we were doing, she started to cry a little bit. See, she had grown up in Beacon and remembered when the factory was still active. Her father had worked in the factory for 30 years and had recently passed away. And she said it made him so sad and the factory started falling apart. And she wished he could be here to see that building being brought back to life. I thanked her for her story. I thought about what she said and I started to realize the real power of what we were doing. This project was able to touch the entire community. It was for all the residents of Beacon, old and new, visitors and lifers. After all the pieces were installed, the results were breathtaking. Just the day before, the building looked like this. And now, it looked like this. <laughs> the day was over, but the entire community was left with something that now belonged to them, and everyone who attended felt like they were part of its creation. It was such a huge success that people started coming to the east end of Main Street just to take pictures of the buildings. People who had purposely not looked at the building for years couldn't stop looking at it. A confused tourist actually came into our gallery one Saturday, pointed at the building, and said, is that the Dia Contemporary Art Center? <laughs> we started thinking about what we could do next. And since the first event was such a success, we wanted to do the next one bigger. So we added two more vacant buildings, more music, and a curated local foods and crafts area. The next Electric Windows event happened in July of 2010. This time, 28 artists from Beacon and beyond were involved. Artists that had volunteered at the first event were now painting this one. Our community had grown. Thousands of people came out to be part of the day. New work for all 24 windows were created, and the other two buildings were transformed as well. People enjoyed a full day of art, music, local food, and local vendors. After the festival, the outdoor gallery remained and there was art everywhere you looked. When people walked around, they looked with their eyes wide open, pointing, talking about what they saw, and asking strangers to take their photos standing in front of the artwork. These buildings that once were invisible because of neglect were now photo opportunities for families and landmarks in their community. 
On the other side of town, I actually overheard someone say, I'll meet you at Electric Windows in 30 minutes. <laughs> Working with the building as a creative canvas was so much fun. We wanted to do more, something different. What else could the building be? We had covered most of the available surface in the immediate vicinity. <laughs> <laughs> and we weren't quite ready to branch out to any other part of town. But one night, we were looking at the building with a friend, and we all thought, those paintings look great at night. Why don't we light them up? So that is exactly what we did. We called it electric projected. The idea was pretty simple, and this picture doesn't quite show it, but there are 24 windows, so we invited 24 animators from across the country to create original animations that would be projected on the entire side of the building. Each animator was assigned one of the windows as a starting point for their animations, and the rest was up to them. They all loved the idea and the project, and they were excited to be part of the project. Here is another community of artists that were willing to donate their time and talent to a projection project in a small town on a vacant building in upstate New York. Over a thousand people showed up at dusk to wait for the projections to begin, but something happened we didn't expect. Rain, strong wind, just as the event was about to start, and the awful weather didn't let up for the rest of the night. We waited nervously for the rain to pass, but it never did. We had to cancel the event. The projections didn't happen that night and we only had the equipment and projection crew for one day. Obviously, we were devastated, and we felt like we had let our community down. However, many people that came out to watch were still around, soaking wet, and everyone asked how it could happen again, what they could do to help. So, in this day and age, we launched a Kickstarter campaign, <laughs> and over the course of the month, 231 people, most from that Hudson Valley, helped us re-raise over $17,000 for the electric projected reboot event. And on October 1st, 2011, the reboot was a reality. The weather cooperated, but we kept the projectors inside just in case. Yeah, that's what we were projecting with. The animations played, the building came alive. People watched in awe, they screamed and clapped for their favorites, they gave each other hugs and high fives as they danced in the street. What does it look like when you project on the side of a four-story factory building? Let me show you. Fast forward to 2013. The east end of Main Street is no longer a sleepy, forgotten part of town. Over the past three years, the area has blossomed with life. One of the old factory complexes has been transformed into a mixed-use hotel, loft, restaurant, and event center. An old theater building is being renovated, and multiple shops, bars, cafes, and galleries have popped up. The electric windows building is still covered in paintings, patiently waiting for its turn to be developed. But now, instead of being surrounded by crumbling reminders of more prosperous times, it's surrounded by the energy of revitalization and transformation. I'm very proud that electric windows and electric projected have been part of this transformation. Vacant buildings like this exist in cities and town everywhere, and this is one example of how people can come together to transform their surroundings, to make something new, something expect unexpected, and something that changes the perception and attitude of their community. If a small group of people in the Hudson Valley can inspire a community to transform a cluster of buildings into an outdoor art gallery and projection canvas, think about how you can apply your passion and experience to look at your environment in a new way. And imagine how you and your community can make it happen. Next time you drive by a forgotten, boarded up building, empty lot, or unused space, take a second look and try and imagine what else could it be. 
What if every town in America had an old factory building covered with paintings? If that were true, I'd start my road trip now, get my skate finished. <laughs>